Yes, it's time. <laughs> I hope everyone has had uh, a good week. Um, notice this cold, wet stuff falling out of the sky. Yeah. You know the old song is it never rains in Southern California. These days it never rains in Northern California either. So it's, uh, it's good that we, we have that. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 23 today. And um, to tell you guys how frazzled I am this morning, I just came up here to teach Bible class without a Bible. But, see, this is why it's great that it's on our phones, right? So, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 23. Let's talk a little bit about kind of where we're picking up. If you remember, starting in chapter 20, David has been on the run from Saul. On the lamb, yeah. Saul's seeking to kill him. Now, David has been really living by lies, hasn't he? And so he, he came and he had this meeting with uh, the high priest Ahimelech. And didn't tell him the truth about what was going on. He does get bread and a sword from Ahimelech. Well... David was seen by Doeg the Edomite, and what happened last week to Ahimelech? Yes, he was exterminated, and all of uh, all of his family except for one, right? One priestly son, Abiathar, comes and he escapes to David. Well, of course, men have been flocking to David, uh, fighting forces. 1 Samuel 22, beginning in verse 1, David is in the cave of Adullam. His brothers and all of his father's household heard of it. So they've come down to him that everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul, a good way, another way to put that is that everyone who was discontented, um, gathered to him and he became a commander over them and I pointed out last week that what you're seeing here is a foreshadowing of what Christ gathering his disciples right because what kind of people were flocking to Jesus it's the same people well here's an application for us We are these people who are distressed. We are these people who are in debt, in our case, because of our sin to God. We are these people who are bitter in soul. Jesus would say, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest. And like these People have fled to David for refuge. We have fled to Christ, David's greater son, for refuge. So that is a um, it's a humbling way to think of ourselves, right? Jesus is not a savior for good people getting better. He's not a savior for the people who have it all together. Of course, actually, nobody has it all together, right? People who think they have it all together are not going to come to him. We come to Jesus, why? For the same reason these men came to David. Realize we're in trouble, and there's this guy whom the Lord has anointed, right, to be our leader, to be our Lord, to be our commander, as it were. So, 1 Samuel 
23, I'm going to try to get through verse 14 today. The main theme of this is kind of that you're living by the word of God. What we're going to see here that David is doing is living by the word of God. God. Um, Jerry, can I get you real quick to, to flip over? You can keep a thumb where you're at, but uh, I need Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, 105. And um, let me see here. Oscar, can I get you to read Psalm 19, 7 through 10 after he's finished? Yeah, 19, 7 through 10. So, Jerry, tell me when you got it. All right. Right, we sing that, right? Thy word is a lamp unto... So this is a story about the word of God being a lamp for David's feet. This is what we're going to see. All right, Oscar, have you got Psalm 19, 7 through 10? Okay, let's hear it. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. All right, so what David is doing there in that psalm is he's breaking down, right? On the one hand, it's a lamp to our feet, it's a light for our path, right? The Word of God. Well, David here breaks down the words of God into, into different, you know, commandments, statutes, ordinances, right? These other things. But the, the benefit of them is that they're pure, they're righteous, they're true. Um... This whole section of, of David's story is David living by the word of God. And the first thing that we're going to see in verses 1 through 5 is that David reigns or rules by the word of God. So let's, see what, uh, let's hear what he has to say, what this has to say here. 1 Samuel 23, 1 through Six. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. So basically, the Philistines are coming. They've invaded um, this Israelite city, and they're, they're ruining the local economy, right? They're robbing the threshing floors. They're pillaging, and, and that's destroying the local economy. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hands. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now here's what's finally happening. Way back, several chapters back, Samuel anointed David king. Right? So, what is the Hebrew word for someone who's been anointed as a king? What? Yeah, it's, it's, it's Mashach, Messiah. It's also in Greek, it's Christos or Christ. That is the word that is used of David, he is, once again, he's foreshadowing Christ, right? He is Israel's Messiah at this point. 
Now, he has not officially been inaugurated. Saul is still reigning, but David is the anointed. This is very much like Christ in his earthly ministry, isn't it? That he is the Christ, he is the anointed one. But, yeah, right, that's when he, that is when he um, rises from the dead and goes to sit at the right hand of the Father, where he is reigning until all of his enemies are made his footstool. So, here is... David and what he's been doing so far is what? Running. Running, running, running. What has he finally done in chapters 22 and 23? He's finally started to accept and grow into and start exercising the authority that God had already given him. He's got forces who have come to him. He is providing refuge for for the one survivor, Abiathar, of Saul's massacre of that priestly family. So David is, is stepped into and is really starting to grow into his role as God's anointed leader. He's starting small, right? He's... He's got 400 men and one priest. <laughs> and he's got a prophet, too, we heard about in the last chapter, named Gad. But he's, he's growing into his role. So what we've just heard here is that the Philistines are attacking this city. They're raiding and pillaging the grain. David is like, okay, somebody needs to do something about this. So he inquires of the Lord, right? And he says, Lord, should, should, should I try to take this city? And God says, what? Do it. So, but when David's, David comes to his men and tells them the plan of what he's going to do, what do they say? Yeah, pretty much. Like, we're going to go show ourselves in public, right? And, and um, what does it say in verse 4? When the, when the men of David are afraid, what does David do in verse 4? Right, and the Lord answered him, Arise and go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. David reigns by God's word. Notice what he does and what he does not do. Does he give his men a, men a pep talk? No. Does he lay a guilt trip on the guys for being afraid? Does he just twist their arms and try to force and coerce them into going? He inquires of the Lord. He seeks a word of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want you to think about this. And think about how Kind of, we've been doing, and I say we, I mean the American church at large, okay? Not just central. But think back on your experiences, because most of us in here have been Christians for a long time. Katie, when you were growing up, did you go to youth events? Like, the speakers who would get up and they're trying to lead you somewhere, right? Did they give you pep talks? 
Did they give you guilt trips? Like, you know, you're not doing this well enough? If you were really... Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, in in the church at large, when we have tried to. lead people somewhere it's it's usually been with a pep talk or a guilt trip or with a guilt trip disguised as a pep talk let me give you an example this is one i um i call it i call it the motivational speaker who they're not they're not really Okay, here's an example. I just thought of this. I once saw there was this really big church, and they had a speaker, and he had cerebral palsy, which was cool. And he, I mean, it's okay. It's not good that he had it, right? But he had done a lot of evangelism in his life. And you're hearing this guy's really inspiring story. Well, then at the end of it, he looks at everybody, and he says, I have cerebral palsy. What's your excuse? And then he goes on to like lay thick this kind of guilt trip on everybody about how they're not doing enough. Here's the thing. How long is that going to actually motivate you? Yeah, because what I noticed, there wasn't a lot of Bible. There was just, look what I did. And Katie, now here's the thing, though. It's good to know, like, that we are not, quote-unquote, good enough. That we, because that's when we are weak, that's when we rely on the Lord. Yeah, I know, but when you're seeing what another guy did, mm -hmm. you're never going to be as awesome as a people faulty guy. <laughs> right. This is, not, this is not the method David is using, is it? That's what I'm saying. There's no emotional manipulation. There's no bullying. There's no strong arming. There's no guilt trip. There's no pep talk. There's just, guys, we're going to inquire of the Lord. Again, we're going to seek the word of the Lord on this, right? And then when they have a confirmation of the word of the Lord, they go out and they strike and guess what? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, that's the other thing. I, only in TV shows like sitcoms and stuff does like the, the fix fix everything all at once, right? Um, I'm sure that many of them marched into battle still. Yeah. Right. And, and here, because here's the thing about faith. Here's the thing about faith. If you want to, if you want to draw a line between the faith that these guys have in David, who's inquired of the Lord, right, and the faith that we have in Christ. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher, he tells the story. Because I always. The Puritans used to say a weak faith can still lay hold on a strong Christ. I love that because how often is our faith weak, right? Charles Spurgeon tells this great story he used to tell. He's been dead for, you know, 150 years, but he used to tell this, or however long, he used to tell this great story about how he was, you know, on this boat between Great Britain and America, and he saw this very big, strong man, right? And then he saw this mother holding a tiny crying baby in her arms. And he kind of likened that to our faith and the ship is Christ. See, Christ can hold the big, strong, the guy with the big, strong faith, right? 
and the one whose faith is weak and they're basically an infant, right? It's, it's not the quality or the quantity of your faith that saves you. It's what? The boat, Christ. Yeah, it's having it, but it's, it's who it's in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, because now, yeah, because that's the other thing, the victory that they attained, right, that is going to what? Strengthen that, which is also, the, even the small victories, right, that we have in our life of faith, you know, we, we find, hey, this, this sin or this fear or whatever it is that I've been struggling with, I'm not struggling with it, what, as much, right? Even those small victories, what, they help build our faith. So, need to move on to verses 6 through 14. This is, I call this, that David is rescued by the word of God. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now, here's why that is significant. It's not so much, because we know that an ephod was basically, it's a priestly garment. It's sort of like, a, like an apron. The reason that it's significant that he has an ephod is what the high priest would keep in the breastplate of the ephod. Um, Mike? Can I get you to read Exodus 28, verse 30? Yeah. Exodus 28, 30. Urim and Tumim. Okay. So, does anyone have have you ever heard of the Urim and Thummim before? Yes, it's a system that God ordained for inquiring of him. We don't know exactly how it works, how it works because it doesn't really tell us. There's a couple theories. One is that it's kind of like this thing and you'd roll it and you'd either come up on yes or no, right? You would ask God yes or no questions. Other theories is that it had some kind of supernatural way that it would light up in certain ways because those words mean lights and perfections. <laughs> yeah, but it didn't get. It only gave you yes or no, apparently. Or like you know, Captain Pike's wheelchair in the old uh, Star Trek episode that you know blinked once for yes and twice for no, right? We don't know exactly how it worked. But the, the, here's the deal: that was a that was a way that you could consult the Lord that He had implemented. Abiathar is bringing the ephod with him. Why? Because it's got those things in it well yeah oh man you're gross Pollard I love you though uh, yeah because it was it was for the it was, it was for the high priest and, and Abiathar has now had to step into that role because all the other priests are well no every priest wore an ephod but this was the special one 
that had that had the the that had the the breastplate of judgment on it um, with the Urim and Thummim. And so um, here we go. All right. So that was that. I'm just giving you that detail because it's going to be, I think, kind of important. Um, now it was told. Saul that David had come to Keilah. So now somebody is snitched right again on David. Yeah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. No. And of course, you know, I love this. He's entered a town. He's got himself shut in. He's entered a town that has gates and bars. We didn't keep the Philistines out. <laughs> And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. And then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, please tell your servant. So the reason David's... I, this is where you think is weird. Why is David asking for the priest's apron? Okay, Because he's, what he's really asking for is what? The Urim and Thummim. And the Lord said he will come down. So basically the Lord is confirming David's question. How? Through those. That's why there's an ephod involved. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, so wow, it was 400 at the beginning of chapter 22, so now it's, you're growing. Arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition, and David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness so basically hiding out in caves in the hill country um, of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. So that's kind of where I want to leave off the, the story for today. Um, so here's the thing. In this story... It, David now, he has just rescued this city, right, from the Philistines. Saul knows that he's there. Saul's going to come after him, so David inquires what of the Lord? Yes. Well, yeah, well, these people that we just rescued from the Philistines give us up to Saul. And the answer that David gets is, yep, you betcha. Which, I mean, that's, that's really stinky. On the other, I mean, you know. I mean, well, I mean, and they've already been decimated by the Philistines, right? I mean, they've just been liberated. Saul's going to come in, because he's probably going to threaten to do what if they don't hand David over? Yeah. So David's kind of like, well, this is the thanks I get. And um, he goes... Yeah. Well, 600. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, and that's, that's the thing. The, Ur the Urim and Thummim could only give yes or no answers. Um, so, that's what's happening here. And I guess here's the question. Because I think David, I think David here actually presents a really good model of leadership. Why? Because he leads how? by seeking a word from God. 
once again, there's no emotional manipulation, there's no guilt trip, there's no pep talk, there's no bullying, there's no coercion, there's simply what? Let us see what God has to say about the matter. Now, we do not have today Urim and Thummim. We have something better. What is it? We have the Holy Spirit, and we have Scripture. One of the things that, that, that we want, I, I think we want to do, um, whether it's church leadership, whether it's as individuals, right, is consulting the Word of God. Now, here's the issue, because here's what people want a lot of times. They want an answer that is as specific when faced with a problem as what David got here, right? How many times have you heard somebody and they're or seen somebody, known somebody, maybe you've been this person, and they're all like, oh man, I need to find out what the Lord's will is for my life about some certain situation, right? As if, and they're so freaked out about it, as if I make the wrong choice right now, I've just ruined everything. I've stepped outside of God's will um, I'm, yeah, I messed up God's plan. I was thinking, I don't know what Tiger King popped in my head. I am never going to financially recover from this, you know, but yeah, I've messed up God's plan. And which is really ridiculous when you think about it. Consulting the word of God. Now, here's the thing. The Bible is a really big book, right? It is a really big book. There's a lot in it. You know where you always actually, I think, want to start when you are consulting Scripture? And once again, not in your own power, not with your own agenda, but what? Kathy, you said it. In the Holy Spirit. right? With the, or Katie, sorry with the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, the same Holy Spirit who did what? Inspired that scripture. This is going to sound really weird, but follow me here. You know what you, all, you, what you start with is the Ten Commandments. Or as they are summed up by Jesus in two commandments, right? What's the first and greatest commandment? And love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. What is the second that is like it? Love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments, what those are, are those are explaining in a little bit more detail what it means to love God and love your neighbor. Right? I love God how? By having no other gods before him. By not having idols by not taking his name in vain, by taking advantage of and in, in, in enjoying the rest he has given me, which how has he given us rest now? In Christ. How do I love my neighbor as myself? Honor your father and mother. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet when we are faced with any kind of decision, start with those and think, you know, is this, is this behavior honoring who I know God is if I choose this course of action and who I know God to be? Every commandment in Scripture, every instruction in Scripture, and there's a lot, right? It's going to go back to at least one of those Ten Commandments. The point, the point that I'm making is that we, we do have a way to consult and inquire of the Lord, and that is Scripture. What did, what did we hear today from the Psalms? Your word is a lamp for my feet 
and a light for my path. Now, if we're looking for a yes or no answer, like in terms of the specific situation, like, oh God, should I go down and rescue this city? God, should I take this job? God, should I do... You're probably not going to get a yes or no answer. Unless, of course, you know, the job you've been offered is as a mafia hitman or something. But we can weigh and consider with the Holy Spirit guiding us, with the wisdom of other Christians, right? Am I... Am I, am I making this decision, is it going to glorify God, or am I making it because it's what's comfortable? Or it's what's going to fit my agenda? Because that would be what? Having another God before him. That would be having an idol. Another thing to consider, and this is where those, those last six commandments come from, too, is... If we make this decision, if I make this decision, how is it going to affect other people? How is it going to affect the people who are around me and right here with me? Especially, how is it going to affect the weakest or the most vulnerable among us or who are with me? You consult God's Word. God's Word starts showing you Those things, and it's not a simple always yes or no. It is what? It is wisdom to guide you. Oscar, can you find that passage in Psalm 19, 7 through 10? Because that's where we're going to end today. Um, are you reading from the ESV, Oscar? Oh, King James? Oh, cool. All right. All right, so the law of the Lord, and that's any commandment in Scripture, is what? It's what? Perfect. Perfect. Right, so it is never going to what? Lead you, the, it's never going to change, and it's because God doesn't change, right? And it's never going to lead you astray, and in fact, it will, by the Holy Spirit's work in you, because Ezekiel 36 says, promises that the Holy Spirit will do what? Give us hearts of flesh in the place of hearts of stone and write God's laws on our hearts. Okay? So, under the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit in us, what does the, the law of God, which is perfect, do? Converts the soul. It changes our hearts to will what God wills. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. What does the Word of God do? It says that if you're simple, what does that mean? I'm ignorant. I don't know a lot. It makes you... What was that, Oscar? Yes, dumb. But it makes you what? Wise. Right? It's teaching you what? How to live in God's world, God's way. The statutes of the Lord are right... Rejoicing the heart, right? We should rejoice over what we learn from God. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, right? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The judgments of the Lord are true and right. Oh, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Here's one for you. There is a fear that makes you run away from God, but there is a fear of the Lord that what? Sends you running to Him. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
So when God has spoken, that is what? That's it. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. We consult the Lord now through something better than whatever the Urim and Thummim were in the priest ephod. We have our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has given us his Holy Spirit, and we have his perfect word.